Tommy is well known in Australia for his service to the Australian Baha'i community on various committees and as the choir master at the House of Worship for 11 years. His success as a music producer and his CDs include Songs of the Ancient Beauty, and I think just about all of us have got a copy of that, and the music writer and conductor for the, for the Voices of Baha'i Choir at the 1992 World Congress. Thank you, Tommy, for taking the time to be with all of us this evening. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, can you all hear me? Aloha, friends. It's very exciting for me. It's been 24 years since two things have happened. 24 years since I left Australia to move to the United States, and 24 years since at any Baha'i meeting, uh, anyone has referred to me as Tommy. So <laughs> I'm very, very pleased that history is being made here tonight. And uh, we'll talk to Barbara later about that. <laughs> And the reason I'm here is that I was invited to speak at the New Zealand Baha'i Summer Schools. Uh, and I just got back from two summer schools in New Zealand. It was very exciting. I think they had 600 or so believers in the North Island School, 100 in the South Island. And I had never really gotten time to, uh, to spend in New Zealand like I did this time. I always thought New Zealanders were just like Australians except they were better players of rugby. I think that's the only difference. Well, that's what they told me over there. I'm sorry, that's, I'm, I apologize. Um, but uh, I found out that the New Zealand Baha'is are just on fire, the way they're teaching and the way they're um, uh, deepening in the faith. It was just a whole lot of fun, and I'm really excited to see a lot of faces. How many of you here were in Australia in 1988 when I left? Oh, yeah, I remember all of you. That's right. <laughs> Wow, that's a lot of you. And how many of you were, have, were here after 1988? I haven't seen you before. Oh, that's great. Well, I hope to get to know all of you. And I believe the title of my talk tonight is Following in the Footsteps of Abdu Baha. Is that correct? That's what they told me uh, that they wanted me to speak on. And this is really exciting because we've been talking about this subject uh, throughout the Baha'i world for the whole past year, and they're still talking about it now because Abdu Baha. Uh, traveled during the period of uh, uh, 1911, 1912, and 1913. So we're in what's called the centenary period of Adi Baha's travels. Right now, I think he's somewhere in London or England. If, if you look uh, on the calendar, he's still in England. I think he's going to go to France pretty soon. I'm talking about 100 years ago. And then on to Stuttgart and... Um, Vienna and Budapest and so on. And this year, uh, our choir is going to travel to all the cities in Europe that Abdu Baha visited in Europe. So the ce celebrations and commemorations of Abdu Baha's uh, travels is still going on for a little while longer. But the House of Justice said that this period is more than a time of commemoration. We're not just supposed to be commemorating Abdu Baha's travels, but rather we're supposed to be looking at what Abdu Baha did and how he did it to see what we can learn to do today. And I want to come to a very interesting message that the House of Justice sent this Rezvan. How many of you were shocked when you read the Rezvan message just a few months ago and they announced the seven temples. How many of you are excited? Wasn't that exciting? And to, to think that there was uh, seven houses of worship were announced uh, to be built, what's seven times nine? 63? Did you know that the, all the National Assembly members in those seven countries did not know before they read that message? They were just reading the message and they, they, because the House of Justice just announced it to the Baha'i world. So 63 people fell off their chairs, uh, uh, just this Rezvan. And the House of Justice, in two paragraphs of one message, the eighth and ninth paragraph of the Rezvan message, more than doubled the number of houses of worships that we will have in the world. There's seven standing, and now there's, there's seven being built and one in construction. So they more than doubled it. And I'd like to ask you, why is it that right now the House of Justice is taking this huge leap forward, this huge evolutionary step in one of the most vital institutions of the world, according to Adi Baha. The Master of Kalaskar Adi Baha said is one of the most vital institutions in the world, and suddenly the House of Justice is more than doubling the number of them. 
And it was so interesting the way the House mentioned it, because they began this letter by saying, a hundred years ago to Rezvan, a hundred years ago at Rezvan, so they're writing the letter at Rezvan exactly a hundred years to Rezvan later, it said a hundred years ago Adabaha went and he broke the ground in the northern suburbs of Chicago and he placed you know, one rock on the ground. We know that Adabaha took this one rock, he put it on the ground, and he said the temple is already built. And I guess the architect could have said, you could have believed, could have fooled me, you know, like, come on. But he did something that was very significant, Rezvan uh, of 1912. And then the House of Justice, to the Rezvan, sends a message and announces the buildings of seven new temples. And it was such an elegantly constructed letter because it began with Adabaha starting a temple, then it had a whole bunch of paragraphs, seven to be exact, in between. And then they announced the other temples. And I think a lot of us forget what was in those seven intervening uh, paragraphs. We forget because we got so excited. And I want to focus on that. But before I do that, I want to say that I think what the House of Justice is calling upon the Baha'i world to do right now is to transform. And to transform rapidly and quickly. And if we want to follow the, thank you for much, who put that picture up? Is it always up here? OK, oh, I like it. Because see, what I have to do, I have an iPad. And see, I have Adabaha's picture on my iPad. You see, I always have it there because I remember when uh, John Robarts came to this country, he said that Adabaha said, whenever you're about to give a, a talk, before speaking, see my face. See me in front of you and then look at it and then give a talk. And John Robarts said he did that before speaking that day. And then he always, he said, now I want you to do that. So when I started conducting Baha'i choirs, I always put Adabaha in my choir. What I did was I was conducting, I would put him right over there in the soprano section, right about there. Now, I don't think Adabaha was a soprano, but that was the best place <laughs> to put him. And so I got in the habit of whenever I was conducting, Adabaha always sat right about there. And if a singer was singing out of tune, like in the solo, I would look to him really carefully and say, you know, help him. And sometimes it worked, but not always. <laughs> but I like having Adabaha's picture because it, it helps us. So thank you for putting that there. Um, and I think that we need to take it upon ourselves to become like Abdu Baha. We need to make it a goal tonight, not tomorrow or the next year or the next year. We need to make it a goal tonight that we want to transform and become like Abdu Baha. And so you're saying to me, oh, well, why didn't you say so? Become like Abdu Baha. Okay, I'll do that. It's not that easy, is it? Because Abdu Baha was perfect. He was the perfect example. Shoghi Effendi said he was the embodiment of every Baha'i ideal and the incarnation of every Baha'i virtue. But the point of Baha'u'llah coming was not for you to label yourself Baha'is. And the point of Baha'u'llah coming was not for you to wear a certain ring or to even attend meetings. The point of Baha'u'llah coming, the purpose of Baha'u'llah revelation was to effect a transformation in you. And if you do not transform, if you do not try to become like Abdu Baha, basically Baha'u'llah suffered for no reason. And he suffered a lot. He suffered his entire life, but he suffered for no reason. And Abdu Baha said this. And um, Baha'u'llah says in the Kitab i Egan, he says, is not the object of every revelation to effect a transformation in the whole character of mankind? a transformation that shall manifest itself both outwardly and inwardly, that shall affect both its inner life and external conditions. For if the character of mankind be not changed, the futility of God's universal manifestation would be apparent. So what he's saying is, is that if your character isn't changed, the whole revelation of Baha'u'llah will be considered futile by Baha'u'llah. He says, my message is futile if you don't transform. Now, uh, the House of Justice, in one of their Rezvan messages, one in 1989, they said that a number of things are not good enough. There's a number of things that are not good enough. Do you think proclaiming the faith is a good thing to do? How many think it's good to proclaim the faith? Come on, raise your hand. It's good to proclaim. How many do you think it's good to, get, uh, to increase the roles of the membership of the faith? You think that's a good thing? OK. Here's what the House of Justice says about these things. It is not enough to proclaim the Baha'i message, as essential as that is. It is not enough to expand the roles of Baha'i membership, vital as that is. Souls must be transformed, communities thereby consolidated, new models of life thus attained. 
Transformation is the essential purpose of the cause of Baha'u'llah, but it lies in the will and effort of the individual to achieve it in obedience to the covenant. So basically, the House of Justice said, it really doesn't matter how much we teach, how much we proclaim. It doesn't matter even how many people we bring into the faith. If people do not change, who cares? I don't care if the entire world tomorrow were to label themselves Baha'is. If they don't change, what does it matter? And I don't care how many people in this room label themselves Baha'is. If they do not act like Baha'is, it really doesn't matter. Abdu'l Baha said that there are three kinds of religion. He said there's three kinds of religion. He said one kind of religion is the religion of your family or your race or your nation or your background. Let's call that category one religion. Do you know anyone who's a category one follower of Islam or Judaism or Christianity? Because their family or their background is that. That's one kind of religion. There's a second kind of religion, Adi Baha said, where you come to know the teachings of the founder, the messenger. You study them and you believe them and you accept them. And that's category two religion. And the third kind of religion, he, he, you know, he said category two is okay, but there's something much better. That's the third kind. The third kind, he said, was the religion of practice, where you actually do what the teacher said. And Adi Baha said, this is the only kind of religion Baha'is can be. We must be a category three religion. It's like hurricanes. You know, you, have, you don't have hurricanes. You have, what do you call them here? Cyclones. cyclones. But do you have categories of them? You don't just say a cyclone's coming. You say a certain category. Okay, Adabaha says, if you want to be a Baha'i, you have to be a category three Baha'i, which is a Baha'i of action. And he said something that really made me mad. When he, it's, in, it's in the book Paris, uh, no, uh, Abdu'l-Baha in London, I'm sorry. It's in Adabaha. He made me really mad. He said, they asked him, what does it mean to be a Baha'i? And he said, to be a Baha'i is to serve mankind, to love mankind, all of the things. And he says, it doesn't matter if someone has called himself a Baha'i for 50 years. If he doesn't do these things, he's not a Baha'i. That's what he said. And he said, then he said, an ugly man can call himself handsome, but he fools nobody. And now I was mad for two reasons in the, in the same sentence. I said, thanks a lot, Abdu'l Baha. Thanks a lot, Abdu'l Baha. And so basically, he went on to say in another passage, he said, he said, if you are a Baha'i and you enter a city, the people should cry out, that man is unquestionably Baha'i because his behavior, his morals, his attitude, his character is that of a Baha'i. Have you read this passage? Do you know what he says after that? He says, not until you've achieved that station can you be said to be faithful to the covenant and testament of God. And I've entered a lot of cities in my life. And so far, nobody, <laughs> nobody has cried out, this man is unquestionably. Has anyone happened to you? <laughs> no? No, is it, no one has happened. And Adabaha said, until you get to the stage where they can just see that you're a Baha'i. So we have a long way to go, it seems, in this regard. Now, I'm thinking about what Jesus said 2,000 years ago. It's a very interesting statement that Jesus said. Um, uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was having a meal on Saturday with his disciples. They were eating and drinking and whatever they were doing, having a meal. And some of them came up to him and said, why aren't you keeping the Sabbath? And Jesus said to him, this to them, they said, nobody puts new cloth on an old garment because it will tear it. And nobody puts new wine into an old wineskin because it will burst. Did you know that Jesus said that? Look it up, it's in Luke 5, 36, 39. I'll read it unto you. And he spake a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old wineskins, else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now, I looked this up, and I found out that everybody knew what Jesus meant in those days. Because in the old days, when you made cloth, when you first made cloth, fabric, the first time you washed it, it shrunk, and it shrunk a lot. Now today we don't know that because fabric is made and manufactured and they pre-shrink it. In those days it shrunk so much that if you had a big hole in your clothes and you patched it with new garment, when you washed it, it shrunk so much that it tore all the other garment around it. It just tore the other garment. So Jesus said nobody patches a new, uh, an old garment with new cloth because it would make a tear. 
And then, this is interesting how they made wine in those days. They would take an animal skin, they would sew, fold it over and sew it up, and it would be a piece of leather. They'd put fruit juice into it, and it would ferment. It would take a while. I don't know how long it takes. How many of you make wine? One, two, three. Okay, so, so they would put it in there, and it would gradually ferment, so it would expand. And then they would drink the wine. And then, if they took and tried to make wine in that thing, you know what would happen? It would burst because it had expanded to the, the, the full extent it could. You could not put new wine into old wineskin. They had to get new ones. And Jesus said, nobody puts a new cloth on an old garment and to stir it because it will cause it to tear. And nobody puts new wine into an old wineskin because you'll lose both. You, you lose both the spirit, the wine, and you lose the wineskin. And he used this as a symbol for religion. And this is a standard symbol that all the manifestations could bring. That when the messenger of God comes and brings a new spirit, you have to have an entirely new vessel to contain it. You cannot take the spirit of the manifestation of God and put it into the vessel of the previous world. You can't do it. You put it in, you lose both, according to Jesus. Likewise, you cannot take a little bit of the message of, of, of the manifestation and patch yourself up. You have to construct an entirely new garment. Take off the old one and put on the new. So Jesus was calling upon his followers to understand that when the Spirit of God comes in every age, you must completely become new. And this is exactly what Baha'u'llah said. Now the House of Justice in the second paragraph, remember those seven missing paragraphs, which you're all going to go back and read of the Red Swan message? The second paragraph, they said this. They said, let none suppose that the civilization towards which the divine teachings impel mankind will follow merely from adjustments to the present order. It says, the, the, the civilization that we're working on is not just going to come from adjusting the present order. I've noticed something interesting since I left Sydney 24 years ago. There's a lot of new houses everywhere. Have you noticed that? There's, I mean, most of the houses are new. I drive through these suburbs, and I realize that there's, there's really three things that you can do to a house. First thing is you can repair it. Have any of you repaired your houses? Yeah, well, yes, you, you have. But there's another thing you can do. We, in America, we call it renovation, in which we seriously change the roof or the walls or something like that. And then there's a third thing you can do, and that's you just tear the whole house down and you rebuild. What do you think the House of Justice is calling upon us to do? They say, let none suppose that the civilization towards which the divine teachings impel humankind will follow merely from adjustments to the present order. Far from it. In a talk delivered some days after he laid the cornerstone of the mother temple of the West, Abdu'l-Bahá stated that among the results of the manifestation of spiritual forces will be that the human world will adapt itself to a new social form, that the justice of God will become manifest throughout human affairs. These and countless other utterances of the Master, to which the Baha'i community is turning time and again in this centennial period, raise awareness of the distance that separates society as it is now arranged from the stupendous vision his father gifted to the world. So basically what the House of Justice is saying is don't think that we can just take the Baha'i teachings and patch ourselves up. Don't think we can take the spirit of Baha'u'llah and pour it into the old forms. We may right now be doing things in our own Baha'i community, the way in which we practice our administration, the way in which we think about religion, the way in which we study religion, the way in which we carry out our own attitude. That is really from the old world, and we try to take the Baha'i teachings and pour that wine in. It doesn't contain it. We have to transform. So I decided to look into the teachings of Abdu'l Baha. Uh, and come up with some of the basic principles of spiritual transformation, the things that are essential. How many of you would like to transform here and now tonight? One, two, three, four. That's good. Four of you. So <laughs> the point is, how do you do it? How do you do it? So I'm going to list three or four or five, however many principles I get, at least four principles of spiritual transformation that I find are essential. The first principle is this. I'm going to ask you a question, first of all. How many of you like it when you're about to go to a movie and someone tells you the end of the movie? Do you like that? You don't like it? 
Okay, what do we call that? You call that in this country? You call it a spoiler? You call it a spoiler. How do you like it when you go and see those trailers and they tell you the whole story of the movie, you know, like from beginning to end? And that's, thanks a lot. I don't need to see the movie anymore. We don't like it. We don't like hearing the end of the movie. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a spoiler to the movie of your life. You're going to die in the end. Okay? <laughs> there it is. I just ruined it for you. I completely ruined your life. I'm sorry to do that. There are no alternate endings to the movie of your life. Nobody has been able to avoid this ending. Everybody's had this ending. But the funny thing is, is that we don't like to think about it. Almost like we don't want to know the ending of a movie. We don't want to know the ending of our life. And we hide this. We put it away. We don't talk about it too much. We hide it from our children because we don't want to think about it. But in fact, thinking about death is the key to life, according to Abdu'l Baha. In fact, Abdu'l Baha was asked once, how does one become spiritual? And he explained a threefold sequence. He explained a threefold sequence. He said the first thing to do is to acquire a thirst for spirituality. That's what he said. The first thing to do is to acquire a thirst. How many of you thirst for spirituality? What does thirst mean? Have any of you been really thirsty and water wasn't available? Have you? You, okay, have you ever been in the desert or lost or something like that? Or, you know, or when you're really thirsty, do you know that feeling? It's that you, that you have to have water. You're going to die without water. If you don't have water, you crave it with every part of your being. That's what thirst means. And Adabha says the first thing to do is to acquire that thirst. Till you have that thirst, you're not going to do it. You're not going to drink water unless you're thirsty. Anyone thirsty right now? I'm thirsty. And... Oh my gosh. It tastes incredible. You know that feeling? Think about that every morning when you wake up. So you have to acquire that thirst for spirituality. He says, then live the life. Live the life, live the life. So before you try to live the life, get that thirst first. So you're thinking, thanks a lot, Adabaha. Just give me the thirst. How do I get the thirst? Okay. He says the way to acquire this thirst is to, and he says something. So now he says, you've got to have the thirst, and that then live the life. But to have the thirst, you have to do something first. Can anyone guess what the first thing is you have to do to acquire thirst? What do you think? Adobha said, the way to acquire this thirst is to... Who can guess? To wish. The way to wish is to wish. I'm sorry? To pray? To die of oneself. Okay, any other guesses? I'm going to read it. I'll read it again. The first thing to do is to acquire a thirst for spirituality. Then live the life, live the life, live the life. The way to acquire this thirst is to... Familiarize yourself with the writings. Is that what you think? Any other ideas? I'll tell you what, I'll read it. The way to acquire this thirst is to meditate upon the future life. You should have known that because I was talking about death. You should, you should have, I, I gave you a clue. Okay. Meditate upon the future life. We don't meditate on the future life. We don't think about it. Now this is a very interesting thing. Adabaha is giving us a clue as to how to transform. He's saying meditate upon the future life. Now, I think that we should do that every day then. Every time you wake up in the morning, you should put your feet on the ground and say, I'm going to die. And in fact, I don't even know when, but I'm going to die. Adabaha seems to think that that will lead you to having a thirst for spirituality. Now, how many of you are like me? The day before you're about to travel on an international trip, that you're packing madly. How many do that? You're packing, packing, packing. How many of you are still packing late at night before you're about to travel the next day? How many of you are still packing the next morning? How many of you are packing even an hour before going to the airport? Isn't that right? And how many of you, even as you're driving to the airport, you're wondering, did I pack everything? Is that right? Yeah. yeah, you can't help it. Now, why do we do that? Why are you rushing around madly doing that? Why? Because you're going somewhere and you want to be sure that you have everything that you need where you go. Isn't that right? You have to be sure that you have it. You may not be able to come back. It might be an international journey. And so you're thinking very carefully, 
what do I need over there? Isn't that right? You think, what do I need over there? What do I need to take? Have I got it packed? What's in my suitcase? Now, you're probably not thinking about the things that you have that you don't need to take the day before. For example, let's say if you're going camping or something, are you worried about packing your 50-inch color television set or something like that? Probably not, because they won't have electricity there. They can't use it there. But you probably are thinking, well, do I need a flashlight or do I need a tent and so on? So you're thinking very carefully, what am I going to do? Now, there's a few things that you cannot take with you to the next world. Right now, you are packing for the next world. And I'm sorry to tell you, I don't know when the plane is going to take off. I have no idea when it's going to take It could take off tomorrow. So what's in your suitcase right now? Well, let me tell you a few things you cannot take with you because there are many things that you can't take with you. You cannot take your house with you to the next world. You can't take your clothes with you. You can't take your wealth with you. You can't take your status with you. You can't take the attention that other people are giving you with you. You can't take luxury with you. You can't take your physical beauty with you. In fact, a lot of the things we're spending a whole lot of time on you can't take with you. And I love it now when I go through security at the airport that they don't let me through now. You know, security is really good. Do you like the security at the airports? Because they stop you and they take things away from you. They take shampoo away from you. I don't understand that. I've never known a 747 to be taken down by a bottle of shampoo. But they take it away from you. Isn't that kind of weird? But I like it now because every time I go through security, it reminds me of the next world. It reminds me of there's things that you just can't take through security of the next world. What are the things that you can take with you? You can take with you the good qualities of the human soul. You can take with you love and compassion and forgiveness and generosity and kindness and courtesy. Think of these things as commodities that can go in your suitcase. So I want to ask you right now, what's in your suitcase right now? What's in your suitcase right now? What do you have? What have you been collecting in your suitcase right now? Because this world is very quick. It's really, this world is nothing but a big packing session. God just puts you in the world and says, pack, because we're going on a journey very soon. And Adabah has keep thinking about that journey. Keep thinking about that journey and pack uh, uh, for your suitcase. I want you to imagine if you go into a doctor's office. And you go in a doctor's office, and there's a bunch of magazines on the desk. And it's like Golf Digest from 1982 and, you know, some magazine that you've never cared about reading, right? But that's the only thing that's there. Is that how they are here in Australia? Really crazy old magazine. Well, let's say you can't take the magazines out of the waiting room. You reach for one magazine in the waiting room. And before you can get it, someone pulls it out of your hand. And so you reach for another one and someone pulls it. And then they're all fighting over the magazines. And then somebody's got ten magazines. He's holding them. And he can't read them all, but he's keeping them all. And that's what this life is like. We're all fighting over magazines in a waiting room. Things that you can't take out, and the doctor is about to call you in, and all you're worried about is fighting over magazines in a waiting room. And really, this life is nothing but a big packing session. And the first thing you've got to remember about packing is don't leave it to the last minute. How many of you have left your packing to the last minute when you go on trips? It's frustrating. You always do it. Isn't that right? But with life, you can't do this. Don't leave packing till the last minute. There's an old story about the little boy that sees his grandfather reading the Bible. And he says, Mommy, how come Grandpa's reading the Bible? And, and she says, he's studying for his finals. You know, he's studying for exams. And then there was another person that saw W.C. Fields reading the Bible. And they knew he wasn't religious. And they said, you know, why are you reading the Bible? And he says, I'm checking for loopholes. You know. <laughs> but unfortunately, there are no loopholes in, 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 uh, in, the, in life. There's no loopholes. You need to be packing for the next world. So if you think about this, every time you wake up, say, I'm going to die, and I'm going somewhere, what can go in my suitcase, what can't go in my suitcase, and start thinking about that. That's the first step to spirituality. The second, well, I'm going to stay on this first step for a moment. When I was in New Zealand, I heard a very interesting thing. I asked the New Zealanders about Australia, and somebody said, the Australians bowl cricket underarm. And they were talking about a game that I remember more than 24 years ago. Do you remember that? Do you remember there was a, some cricket match where the Australians bowled underhand? You probably forgot it, right? No. Does anyone remember it? Yes. The New Zealanders told me. And they got really mad. And I said, I said three words, New Zealanders, get over it. You know, I said, get over it. <laughs> and they said, we're never going to get over it. They, they said, we're never going to get over it. The Australians bowled underhand in a game, and, and we didn't get to win the game. 
And so I said, I remember that game. And as I recall, the Australians played it correctly because it was the last ball and it was the end of the game. And if New Zealand had scored any more, then they would have won or something. It was a tie game or something. So they were playing within the rules. And they said, yes, but it wasn't fair. They didn't like it. And then New Zealand are never going to get over it. They'll go to their grave. And I said, this is a very good spiritual point. This is a very good spiritual point because it points out something interesting about life. Life is like a game. Games only work when they end. Games only work when they end. If you look at any game, a game makes sense because at some stage it's going to be over and they're going to take score. Can you imagine if you played tennis and you just hit the ball and hit the ball and they didn't keep score and you could hit it? What, what would be the point? Or if you played cricket or you played soccer or anything and they didn't have time or a certain number of overs, what would be the point? Would anybody play the game well? Is the game not played better because you know that there's going to be an end and when the end comes, the score is going to be taken? Would you agree? So I think games are very spiritual in that regard because they teach us the f What happens when a team gets to the end of the game and they lose and then the announcer says, oh, they had so many opportunities that they could have done earlier and they didn't take advantage of it. So we should think about this. Think right now, what is in my suitcase and what if I die today? I know one person they told me, and I thought they were stupid. They said, they said I always make sure to wear clean underwear because I'm never sure I could have a car accident and then when I'm unconscious they'll cut me and they'll see my clean, clean underwear. And I'm thinking, this is stupid. Is that the, at a time like that when you're worried about life and death, you're worried about what people are going to think of your underwear? And, and they were obsessed with this. I thought it was a crazy obsession. But then when I thought about it, I thought Baha'u'llah pretty much said the same thing but in different words. He pretty much said the same thing. He said this. He said, bring thyself to account each day Ere thou art summoned to a reckoning. For death unheralded shall come upon thee, and thou shalt be called to give account for thy deeds. Now there's no mention of underwear. But there is the idea that you never know when you're going to be uh, called to the next world. And when you are called to the next world, he says you'll have to give account for your deeds. So it could actually happen tonight on your way home. Forget about your underwear, but you're definitely going to have to give account for your deeds. And so he says, bring thyself to account each day, ere thou art summoned to a reckoning, for death unheralded shall come upon thee. So this leads to the second great principle of spiritual transformation. What is the first principle of spiritual transformation? Let's summarize. It's to think that this life is going to be over, just like this talk. It's going to be over, <laughs> and just like a game is going to be over, and just like when you go on a journey. In other words, you have to think about it. Abdu'l-Bahá says that is your prime motivation. The second principle is in that quotation that we just read of Baha'u'lláh, where he says, bring thyself to account each day. Because basically what he's saying is that you must do something on a daily basis. Did you notice that? He said each day. And there's a lot of other things in the Baha'i writings that we have to do daily. Can you think of any others? Obligatory prayers, what else? 95 Allahapa, what else should we do daily? I'm sorry? Yes, what else? Anything else? Teach the faith, yes, what else? I'm sorry? Yeah, but certain things he actually says each day. So I'm going to make this a goal of you. I want you all to find in the writings anything that you're supposed to do daily. But let's talk about this for a moment. Did you know that everything that lives on earth physically, plants, animals, insects, humans, they all have a clock inside uh, their DNA called a circadian clock. Circadian, circadian, circa means approximately or about. And dian means day, circa dian, about a day. And it's a clock that's in your brain. You actually have one in your hypothalamus gland. Hypothalamus gland. Do you know where your hypothalamus gland is? Okay, everyone tell me where their hypothalamus gland is. No, 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 it's in the head. It's right, right between the eyes, or right behind the heart bone. Touch it there and right in the middle. There's this clock in there. And it, this clock is very, very precise. It says the circadian rhythm is a 24-hour clock in biochemical physiologically or behavioral processes, circadian rhythms have been observed in all plants, animals, fungi, and cyanobacteria. So if you're any of those things, if you're 
plant, animals, fungi, or cyanobacteria, you have it. The term circadian comes from the Latin circa meaning around and diem meaning day. Circadian rhythms are built in. They have a 24-hour period, and they can only be trained a little bit. They can only change. In fact, they found that your clock that's in your brain can only be trained to be 23.5, 23 and a half hours, to 24.65. So it just about a half an hour. And 24.65 is a good thing that you have that, because that's the exact length of the day on Mars. So if you ever do go to Mars, you'll be OK. That's a good thing. Go to any planet bigger than Mars and you're dead. OK. Now, the interesting thing is, is that science has found, they call this chronobiology. Chronobiology is a study of time in relation to biological processes and temporal rhythms. It, they study daily, tidally, weekly, seasonal, all the kinds of rhythms. And they find that life is absolutely essential to follow these 24-hour clocks. Physical life is dependent on certain things happening. In fact, we know that physical life requires six things to stay alive. If, if physical life doesn't get six things, it doesn't stay alive. Who can tell me what those six things are? What do you think you need? You need air. You need oxygen. You need what else? You need water. OK, what else? Temperature right. You need to stay within a certain range of temperature. That's exactly right. You, you can't go too cold or too hot. So air, water, and temperature, what else? I'm sorry? Food, yes, food. You need food. What else? I'm sorry? No, you don't need gravity. I'm sorry? But it's, it's something related to gravity. It's motion. You need uh, life needs, it needs uh, physical life needs motion. And there's one more, it's sleep. You got to get all of these. Now, if you, if you look at any animal, look on the documentary and stuff, the animals are just looking for these six things. The temperature gets too hot or cold, they go north or south. If they don't have food, they look for it. If they don't have water, they look for it. They don't have air, you know, they, you understand? And animals quickly learn that you need these six things. They also, they know pretty well that you need to get all six. You know, you can, you, could, you could remember to eat every day, you can remember to sleep every day, you can exercise every day, and you can drink water every day, and so on. But you forget to breathe, and of course you're not going to live. And it's true with all of them. You can die from all of these things. So, the House of Justice has said, in several letters in the 1980s, that there are a certain number of things that are essential to spiritual life. And they even pointed out in another message that physical laws and spiritual laws are, are similar. They said just as there are physical laws that determine that we must stay within a certain range of temperatures and do certain things, so also are there spiritual laws. And if you break the physical laws, you're dead. If you break the spiritual laws, you also don't have spiritual life. And they said there are six things essential to spiritual life. Isn't that interesting? Six things, they said. And they didn't, they didn't, I was excited because it's the same thing that they say in biology. Now, who could tell me what some of those six things are that you must do? Prayer. Let me read what he says here. At the dawn of every day, he should commune with God. In another passage, he says that you should do something else every day. I'm going to read it to you, and you tell me if you think this is circadian or not. I'm going to read it to you. This is from the Kitabi Akdas, Baha'u'llah says. Recite ye the verses of God every morn and evening. Whoso reciteth them not hath truly failed to fulfill his pledge to the covenant of God and his testament. And whoso in this day turneth away therefrom hath indeed turned away from God since time immemorial. So is that circadian? Let me read it again. Recite ye the verses of God every morning and evening. Is that circadian? Nah, it's by circadian. I tricked you. Because it's twice a day. Circadian means once a day. I tricked you. I was, I was trying to trick you. OK. I think that's funny. OK. So the point is, is he says do it every morning and every evening. And you say, well, OK. Well, I don't do it every single morning and evening, but God will forgive me. And then he says, whoso reciteth them not hath truly failed to fulfill his pledge to the covenant of God. And I don't really like that. So I'm thinking, well, how much do you have to read? Fortunately, if you read in the Octas, he says, he says to read one verse or even one word with joy and radiance is preferable to the perusal of many books. So he's not making it very hard. 
you could just read one word, as long as it was joy and radiance. So put a big smile on your face and be really happy and read one word, and that would be enough. So it's really not that hard to read the Word of God at least once in the morning and once at night. But if it is just the same as breathing or eating or sleeping or all of the other physical things, it's deceptively simple. It's deceptively simple. How many of you eat at least once a day? Admit the truth. How many of you eat more than once a day? Exactly. How many of you sleep usually once a day? Yeah, every now and then maybe you don't. How many of you breathe? Uh, how long can you go without breathing, by the way? I think most people only 90 seconds, but divers can do like five minutes or something like that. So we remember to do these things physically. And the House of Justice is saying it's exactly the same spiritually. That there are certain things. Now there's one thing that Baha'u'llah said you have to do every single day. And that's to evaluate yourself. That's what he said in this quote that I, that I introduced this section. He said, bring thyself to account each day ere thou art summoned to a reckoning. And the important thing is, is that daily evaluation is the great step towards spirituality. Until you learn to do daily evaluation, you cannot grow spiritually. As soon as you do, you can grow. Let me read you what Adabaha said. He said, every day in the morning when arising, you should compare yourself with yesterday and see in what condition you are. If you see your belief is stronger and your heart more occupied with God and your love increased and your freedom from the world greater, then thank God and ask for an increase of these qualities. You must begin to pray and repent for all that you have done which is wrong and you must implore and ask for help and assistance that you may become better than yesterday so that you may continue to make progress. So what Adi Baha is basically telling you here is don't compare yourself to anybody. Do not compare yourself to anybody except yourself yesterday. And we make mistakes comparing ourselves to people. Sometimes we look at people and we think, oh, they're so good, they're so spiritual, I can never be like them. Other times we might look at a person and say, oh, I'm a whole lot better than them. You, you see, we can do either way. We can compare ourselves either favorably or unfavorably to people. But Adabaha says, do not compare yourself to anybody. Just compare yourself to yourself yesterday. And the goal in life is to beat yesterday. Just try and beat yesterday. Is that not so hard, is it? Just try and beat yesterday. Now, this is a very interesting thing because that means that we cannot judge anybody how spiritual they are because we don't know how they're progressing. We can look at a certain person and think, oh, they're so fantastic, they're so spiritual, but maybe they're no more than they were a year ago or 10 years ago. We can look at another person and maybe we think they're really terrible, but maybe they're better than they were yesterday. So, and, and according to Adi Baha, the, the person that's spiritual is a person that's growing day by day. Now, I want you all to make a decision here and now to be a little better tomorrow than you are today. And I don't care how bad you are today. Okay, if you murder 10 people today, try tomorrow to murder nine people. Okay, now you're laughing, but the point is that in 10 days you won't kill anybody, so that will be good. And secondly, there are a lot of people in the world doing all kinds of terrible things like murder and even other things. They have to have some path whereby to correct. If the world were perfect, Baha'u'llah wouldn't have even come. He came to give us all a path. So I, I'm not joking when I say try to kill nine people tomorrow. I hope that, that uh, none of you have killed 10 people today, but the point is it's the dailiness that Adi Baha is trying to get at. Dailiness is a very important process. Adi Baha says this. He says, therefore I say that man must travel in the way of God. Day by day he must endeavor to become better. His belief must increase and become further. His good qualities and his journey to God must be greater. The fire of his love must flame more brightly. Then day by day he will make progress. For to stop advancing is the means of going back. The bird when he flies ever higher and higher, sorry, the bird when he flies soars ever higher and higher. For as soon as he stops flying, he will come down. See what he's saying here? When a bird is constantly flying, he's flying. But let's say the bird's way up there and he decides to stop flying. What happens to the bird? 
he goes down. Shoghi Effendi said something a little different. Shoghi Effendi said that life is like rowing upstream. You know, if you're rowing upstream. And he says, if you rest on your oars, you can't stay in the same spot. If you rest on your oars, you go downstream. You're either going up or down. There's no standing still. I guess maybe you could row just enough to stand still, but Shoghi Effendi basically said it's like that. So this is a very interesting thing. It's the dailiness that matters. And only two days ago, there was a report in one of the scientific journals. You can look it up. It's on some African finches, you know, birds. And they created little headphones for the birds. And they had a picture on the internet. They, little, they put little headphones on the birds. And they intercepted the signal into the birds' headphones. And they corrected the pitches. Not corrected, but altered the pitches. Because they wanted to see how birds learn to sing. Because birds sing really well. I mean, they, they, they learn melodies that are even harder than humans. As I said, if we can figure out how birds can learn to sing, then perhaps we can help the Sydney Baha'i Temple Choir. I, they didn't say that. No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. No, 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 no. It, it, wasn't, in the, it wasn't in the report. But they did say that they wanted to learn how birds learn to sing to help humans to sing. So what they did was they put the sound in and they altered electronically some of the pitch that the bird heard. So the pit, bird would sing a certain pitch, but they would change it, intercept it, and put it in their headphone so it went higher or lower to see if the bird would alter his pitch, see if it changed his tune, because they wanted to see the brain process of the birds. And they found something interesting. When they altered the pitch by a large amount, like a whole step, the bird would hear the pitch, they'd hear the altered pitch, and they wouldn't change one little bit. They would just keep singing the same wrong pitch that they're hearing. But if they altered the pitch a little bit, like a half step or a quarter of step, the bird adjusted. So the bird had the ability to adjust, provided they broke it down into a smaller pitch area. But if it was too big, the bird didn't make any effort at all. And they found that if you make something too big for someone to learn, they don't do any learning at all. But if you can break the task down into a small increment, they can learn and then they can ultimately come down. Isn't that interesting? We live in a world right now where we want everything quick. We want, isn't that right? We want everything fast. We want you know, microwave pizza and, and microwave popcorn and fast foods. Isn't that right? We want everything fast. And if we can't get it, then we just don't get it at all. We're not used to it. They, they, you know they say in France they'll eat snails, but Australians and Americans won't eat snails because we only like fast foods. That's because we only like things that are quick, you know. And, and the thing is, is that what Adha Baha is explaining here is that you need to do things in small increments. You, you might not be able to see it, just like the little finches. So dailiness is really important. Now, I learned this when I was first studying violin from a violin teacher. His name was Manuel Kempinski. You look him up on the internet. He was considered one of the great violinists in America. He was the concertmaster of Toscanini's symphony, which was the greatest symphony in America at the time. He was the concertmaster means he was the leader of the whole orchestra, the first chair, first violin. And he was considered the greatest violin teacher in Los Angeles area where I was growing up. And he said to me when I was very young, he said, I want you to make sure you at least take the violin out every day and play it. Just open the case, take the violin out, and play it every single day. And he said, if you played the violin for five minutes a day, for a whole week, once a day, just five minutes, that would be better than playing the violin for two hours on one day. And it made no sense to me. Because two hours on one day is four times the amount of time uh, that, that five minutes a day is, if you add up the time. Now, I never understood why he said this. I thought maybe he thought that if you pulled it out for five minutes, you would accidentally play 15 or 20 and, and so on. And so he was just trying to get you to do that. But I wonder if anyone's ever done a study on this. I would love to see if someone's done a study to see if he was right. He was considered one of the greatest violin teachers uh, in the world at the time. And he understood the importance of dailiness, the circadian power, the same thing that Baha'u'llah was talking about. So this is part of the rhythms of life. I'm going to move on to the next, the third principle of spirituality. What are the first two principles of spirituality now? First is to meditate on the future life. To remember that you're packing for a journey that you can't put off. I mean, you can put it off a little bit, but maybe not. I'm sorry to say, you never know. Baha'u'llah said, death unheralded shall come upon thee. It's not even a flight, you can't even book your death to the next world. It's just going to come to you. So that's the first thing, is to meditate upon it. The second is to do a whole bunch of things daily. 
which we can talk about more and we've talked about. The third is to find God. Third is to find God, but that's a trick. That's, that's a trick thing. Because how do you find God? First of all, who is God? Does anyone know who God is? Raise your hand if you know who God is. Raise your hand if you understand God. Nobody? Oh, come on. Raise your hand if you know God. Raise your hand if you know God a little bit. <laughs> Nobody's going to raise their hand. Okay. Well, it's okay, but not really. Because we're told in the Baha'i writings that there's two things about God. One is unknowable and one is knowable. The thing that's unknowable is the essence of God. We can never know the essence of God. He's unknowable. His essence is unknowable. And we can never know God in the same way that the painting can never know the painter. What is that? The, yeah, yeah. The paint and the painting and the wall and the frame. None of it can know the painter. Okay, does that make sense? He says we can't do that. But he says you can know the attributes or names of God, the names and attributes as opposed to his essence. This is kind of like we, we don't know the whole sun. We can't go land on the sun or something. But we know its heat. We know its warmth. We know it's electromagnetic waves. We know certain things that are emanating from the sun. And this is the same. The attributes of God are things such as love and compassion and forgiveness and kindness and mercy. You do you know all these things? These are good qualities. How do you know these qualities? Does it just come beaming at you from outer space, from God? How do you know these qualities? Where do you see them? God, okay, you see them in other people. You see them in other people. And Adabaha explained that if somebody wasn't merciful, how would you know that God is merciful? If somebody wasn't generous, how would you know that God is generous? In other words, if you didn't see in human beings a certain capacity for these good qualities, you wouldn't know that God had them. Therefore, he's trying to explain to us Remember that God is a bundle of attributes. That's what God is. God is a bundle of attributes. Now, any time you see a person, look for the good qualities in them. Look at Scott right now, and he's smiling. So I say that happiness or joy is an attribute of God. So I'm not seeing Scott right now when he smiles. I'm seeing God. Look at another person. Look at uh, Loretta, and you see that Loretta, well, she's smiling too, but Loretta is quite generous, I think to myself. She's a generous person, so I see generosity. I'm not seeing Loretta now. I'm seeing God. Anytime you see a good quality in any person, you're seeing God. And the goal in life is to look for good qualities in people. Go around and look for it. Look hard for it. Sometimes you've got to look harder uh, than you know, certain people. You have to look pretty hard. But the goal in life is to look for that because every time you find a good quality, generosity, kindness, merciful, forgiveness, you just saw God. And every single person is an unopened letter from God. Every single person that you sit next to at the table at work or eating or something, it's God is sitting next to you. But instead, we don't look at the good qualities in a person. We look at their bad qualities and we ignore it. When my son was first born, when he was in the hospital, he came out and the doctor held him up, looked at him, and he looked at me and he said, he looks just like his father. And the nurse pointed to the baby and said, yes, but you're looking at the wrong end. And <laughs> this, this is exactly what we do to people. We look at the wrong end. We're not looking at their top, we're looking at their bottom. And as a result, we miss their good qualities and we don't see their good qualities because we're focusing on them. Now, Adabaha said, do not make this mistake. He said, if someone has one good quality, no, actually, he said, if someone has nine good qualities and one bad, he said, ignore the bad one and just look at the good ones. He said, if somebody has just one good quality and 10 bad ones, and I think I know who he was talking about there. I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, but he said, if someone has 10 bad ones, and one, just look at the one good one. Just focus on that. Like if you look at stars in the sky, you don't look at the black, you just look at the stars. You just focus on them and you ignore the black. And he says, do this with all people and you will find that you are seeing God every day. Now, have any of you ever gone shopping for a new car and maybe you didn't buy that model and you just looked at it in a brochure or you went to the car dealer and looked at it and then when you were driving home, you saw that model car passing you on the road 
Did any, that happen to any of you? You must say to yourself, why is that happening? That car must have been passing me before, but I never noticed it. And now I spend five or 10, 15 minutes looking at the car, and now I notice it because I focused on it. And this is what it's like. God is passing us by every day in life, but we're not focusing on it, so we don't see it passing us by. Once you decide to focus on it, you see it all the time. And suddenly, it becomes a game. Every day, I'm on an expedition to find God in the people I'm working with, the people I'm going to school with, the people I am uh, meet in the street, who are my Baha'is, my Baha'i friends. Believe it or not, there's even God in some of your Baha'i friends. Because Baha'u'llah said that everybody is a mirror that reflects God to a certain extent. They said human beings have the capacity to reflect just like a mirror and uh, everything else in physical creation can partially reflect God, he says, but human beings can completely reflect God if they become pure. When I was in India, they wore these clothes that had little tiny mirrors in a few places. Have you ever seen those? Most of them were not mirrors, but just a mirror here and there. And I like to think of people like that that most of them don't reflect, but there's a mirror there. They're like Indian clothes. And the mirrors are what reflect God. So we need to try and find God in every person every single day. And this can be fun. It can be fun because in some cases it's really hard to both ignore the bad quality and to see the good. But if you do that, then you're going to become more spiritual. It's, a, it's just a general principle that you're going to become more spiritual. Now. The fourth, or the fifth, you want to do, you want to do another one? Yeah. You want to do another? The next one is to understand that you cannot become spiritual unless you act, unless you try to do something. Remember I talked about uh, how uh, Abdu'l Baha said there's three kinds of religion, and the, what is the third kind of religion? The religion of action. There is no way to become spiritual unless you actually try and practice it. You cannot go and live in a cave, and pray, and meditate, and do all those things, and become spiritual. You must interact with people. You must try and do things. That's why the House of Justice said there were six things that one has to do to develop spiritually. The first one was pray daily, and they mentioned obligatory prayer. The second was to read the writings. The third was to meditate on the writings, three different things. Who can tell me what they think the other three were? Who wants to guess? Pick one of the other three. Action, but let's break it down into three different forms of action. Service. Service is one of the other three. Service to the Baha'i community. Service, okay, that's good. What's two others? Teaching. And what was the other one? I actually already mentioned the other one. Giving to the fund, they didn't mention that. Because you don't have to do it daily. Okay, you go broke. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it, once every two days, I think. No, it, they said striving to bring your life more in accordance with the Baha'i teachings. In other words, trying to become more spiritual. So do, would you agree that these other three things are action-oriented? This is a very important thing because right now, um, Baha'is are called upon to do something, and it's all action-oriented. We have a plan that the House of Justice has given us, which we call the five-year plan, which is part of a series of plans that go all the way back to 1937, when Shoghi Effendi first launched plans. But even then, they go back to 1916, when Adabaha launched the Tablets of the Divine Plan. And all the plans that we have now are part of the Tablets of the Divine Plan of Adabaha. And Shoghi Effendi said the Tablets of the Divine Plan are the weightiest spiritual enterprise in recorded history. Is that, is that sound like an exaggeration to you? It, it does to me, except Shoghi Fendi said it. So it's not. It's the weightiest spiritual enterprise launched in recorded history. And there's been a lot of spiritual enterprises launched in recorded history. I can think of, you know, the Crusades or whatever. And he says this is the weightiest. And we're told by the House of Justice that the five-year plan is part of that. So right now, I'm thinking, as I'm about to drive to my study circle, or I'm going to be an animator of junior youth, or I'm going to you know, go to reflection gathering, and someone says, where am I going? I say to them, to the weightiest spiritual enterprise in recorded history. You know, and they say, well, who's going to be there? I say, well, three people. But you know, it's still the weightiest <laughs> spiritual enterprise launched in recorded history. 
This is what we have to do. We have to act, and we're given a channel by which we can act. But in order to do it, we need to understand something. And how many of you would like to have a guarantee of success and well-being in all your endeavors to serve the faith? Who? Raise your hand if you would like to have a guarantee of well-being and success in all your endeavors to teach. One, two, three. Good. Okay. So I'm going to read you a quote from the House of Justice in which they tell us how you can guarantee to have well-being and success. They say this. The guarantee of well-being and success in all your endeavors to serve the cause can be stated in one word. You know what? I'm not going to read that word. I'm going to say blank. I'll keep reading the quote and then see if you can guess the word. The guarantee of well-being and success in all your endeavors to serve the cause of God can be stated in one word, blank. It is the alpha and omega of all the high objectives. Now, if anyone knows this quote, you're not allowed to answer. Or if you heard me speak on this before. But those who have never heard it, I want you to guess it. Think very carefully. The guarantee of well-being and success in all your endeavors to serve the cause of God can be stated in one word. Who Raise your hand. Who can tell me what they can guess that word might be? Service. Okay, you think you could be right. Anyone want to make another guess? Yes. Sacrifice. What do you think? Prayer. prayer. Let's got to keep a count here. Someone take notes. Service, sacrifice, prayer. One of them will take a vote later. Well, any others? Action. Action. Love. Anybody else? What are they? Service, prayer. What do you got? Action, love. What else? Anyone have any other guesses? Steadfastness. I, I like that one. Any others? Patience. Keep thinking about that. What else? <coughs> Faith. That's got to be it. Let me see. The guarantee of well-being and success in all your endeavors to serve the cause can be stated in one word, faith. Could be. Any other guesses? Unity. Unity? Okay. How many is that now? Any other guesses? We only got one word. And this is the house of justice. They say it is the alpha and omega of all Baha'i objectives. Alpha Omega is the first and last letter in the Greek alphabet. In other words, it's the beginning and end. I'm sorry? Teaching. Maybe that's what it is. I'm going to change my vote. Anybody else? I'm sorry? Obedience. Okay. Purity. Okay, this is all. This is from the Universal House of Justice. I'm going to read it now. I'm sorry? The covenant, of course, it's got to be the covenant, but it's not. So let's read it. <laughs> let's read it. The guarantee of well-being and success in all your endeavors to serve the cause of God can be stated in one word, unity. It is the alpha and omega of all the high objectives. Did you say unity? Very good. You, I'm sorry? Yes but, yes, but somebody else said love, didn't they? In my opinion, love and unity are really very similar. Because if you read what unity means in the Baha'i writings, we realize that it's something far more important than just kind of holding hands and singing kumbaya and having fun. <laughs> unity is a far... There's one passage where Baha'u'llah says, such is the state of the world that there are no two people that can be said to be completely united. And so, therefore, we know that Baha'u'llah has a concept of unity that's far different to ours. And we have to understand that everything we're doing in the faith, if it's causing disunity, it's, it's no good. The, the administration, everything, teaching, whatever we're doing, if disunity is a part of it, then it's defeating the purpose. Let me read you two quotations from Shoghi Effendi that the House of Justice recently referred us to. Um, the House of Justice says, uh, or the Guardian says this, the friends must never mistake the Baha'i administration for an end in itself. It is merely the instrument of the spirit of the faith. This cause is a cause which God has revealed to humanity as a whole. It is designed to benefit the entire human race. The only way it can do this is to reform the community life of mankind, as well as seeking to regenerate the individual. Baha'i administration 
is only the first shaping of what in future will become the social life and laws of community living. Shoghi Effendi's advice to an individual in another instance provides a further perspective. He urges you to do all you can to promote unity and love amongst the members of the community there, as this seems to be their greatest need. So often, communities in their desire to administer the cause lose sight of the fact that these spiritual relationships are far more important and fundamental than rules and regulations which must govern the conduct of community affairs. Now, what basically we're told is this, is that unity is what we are here to bring to the world. If we cannot bring unity to the world, um, it really doesn't matter what else we do. In fact, Shoghi Effendi said that the cause will never grow until Baha'is manifest in their community life true love and unity. If the faith is not growing here and now in Sydney, it's only the extent to which we are united. It's only the extent to which we are united. Because Baha'u'llah used a very interesting analogy to explain what unity was. He said unity was a light. Did you know that? He said, so powerful is the light of unity that it can envelop the whole earth. And when I first read that, I said, that is the, not the right analogy for, for unity. You know, if you asked me to come up with a symbol for unity, I would have said maybe glue. You know, so powerful is the glue of unity that it can stick together the whole earth. In other words, you don't immediately, if someone, if you had a committee and you didn't have this quote and they said, let's come up with a symbol for unity, who would come up with light? You wouldn't do it, right. So why does Baha'u'llah compare unity to light? I want you to think about this. When Baha'u'llah received his revelation, he was in the Sea of Shal. Did you know the Sea of Shal was so dark you couldn't see your hand right in front of your eyes? It was several flights of stairs down. It was pitch darkness. And in that spot, when Baha'u'llah was in the darkest spot, with a hundred pound chains around him, with a stench that you could barely uh, tolerate, he was the light giver of the world. Light came to the world in the darkest spot. And today, we also are in our own Sia The world is black. Would you agree the world is black? It's dark in other ways. We are imprisoned. We have chains on us. The world has chains on us. We're in darkness. Now, where does light shine the best? Where can you best see light? In darkness. Take a flashlight outside in the noonday and turn it on. You can barely tell if it's on or off. Take a tiny little match out in, in the dark of night and you can see it. Light shines best in darkness. This is why Baha'u'llah revealed in the Sia Shal. And this is why we today are there. Shoghi Effendi said, until such time as we can manifest unity in our communities, the world is never going to uh, come in large numbers. They're never going to be attracted to the faith in large numbers until such time as they see the light of our unity. This is why Baha'u'llah wanted to explain that unity is a light. How attractive is unity? Have you ever been to a community that's united? Or any group that's united? When they're united, we love it. This is why we like to be with our friends. You know, not even Baha'i friends. Just any, any group of people that love to be together, it, it has an attractive force. It attracts us. Right now, the thing that the world will see is if we are united. Now, there are three ways in which we can be united. There's different forms of unity. Who can tell us what are the three areas that need to develop in our Baha'i communities today? What are the three areas that need to develop? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Thought. Oh, good. But the House of Justice has said in the five-year plan and in all the plans since 1996, there are three areas of development, kind of like three legs of a tripod, that all three have to grow. You know, if you take a tripod and cut off one leg, what happens? It falls over. So they said there are three areas that need to develop. What are the three? The individual, which we've been talking about. So you need to develop as an individual. What is another area that needs to develop? Communities, and what is another area that needs to develop? The institutions. Now, all three, the House of Justice say, needs developing. So don't come up and complain to me that your institutions are not perfect. And don't come up and complain to me that your, per your communities are not perfect. And don't come up and complain to me that Baha'is are not perfect. Because the House of Justice, they need to develop. Isn't that right? 
So there's no problem that they need to develop, but they all three need to develop. How many of you feel as individuals you need to develop? Good. How many of you feel that your institutions could use a little more develop and transformation? Of course. How many of you feel that a community needs to have a certain development? Of course. The House of Justice explains that one of the things that needs to develop is the relationship between these. Not just that each develops individually, but the relationships between them. The ways in which individuals love institutions is completely broken down in the world, they say. They say the world is ungovernable because of the distrust of, of, of government and order and so on. Likewise, the way in which institutions view people and try to control them and dominate them and, and don't have an attitude of service. This is also breaking down in the world. Also, the ways in which communities interact with institutions, individuals. This is the darkness of the world. It's the disunity of the three component elements of society. And if at any time a Baha'i community, if at any time a Baha'i community gets that right, the whole world will see it just like a light will be shining in darkness. Just like a light will be shining in darkness. And so the House of I want to come back now because I want to finish. The House of Justice, I want to come back to this latter part of the message that we got at Rezvan. And they say something. They say that throughout the Baha'i world, they say that things are happening. And they use this term. They say within such unassuming settings, a visible alternative to society's familiar strife is emerging. They say such unassuming settings. They refer to the fact that in certain unassuming settings, an alternative to the world, a light to the darkness of the world, is emerging. It says, so it becomes apparent that the individual who wishes to exercise self-expression responsibly participates thoughtfully in consultation devoted to the common good, and spurns the temptation to insist on personal opinion. So they're saying something is emerging where the individual does not insist on his personal opinion. Do you know that Adabaha said one thing is the greatest barrier to unity? Do you know he said that it's in Paris talks? What is it? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Well, he could have said that too, but he said something else. He said, one thing is the greatest barrier to unity. Yeah, he said it, but before he said the word insistent self, there was another term in there. He said it was the belief that you are right. The belief that we are right is the greatest barrier. And I'm sure Adabaha thought he was right when he said that, but he was allowed to <laughs> because he was infallible, so he could do it. Now, how many of you think you're right? Of course, raise your, everybody raise your hand. We all think we're right. That's natural. But... That causes disunity. So the House of Justice is saying the individual who participates in self-expression responsibly and spurns the temptation to insist on personal opinion. Because when you insist on personal opinion, that is part of self. As Scott and Adabaha continue, he used the term. Uh, I didn't mean Scott is insisting on his personal opinion. He actually mentioned the term insistent self. And he insisted on saying that. Um, <laughs> and he was right, because it was in that same quotation. So this is, the House of Justice is saying, in unassuming settings throughout the world, there's a certain group of Baha'is that are changing the way in which they view the world. And they don't think they're right. They, they have a joy in being wrong. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? It's a, a completely new way of looking at the world. And then they say, they continue, a Baha'i institution appreciating the need for coordinated action channeled towards fruitful ends aims not to control but to nurture and encourage. So now they're saying that suddenly you have institutions that are not trying to control but they're trying to nurture and encourage. Everywhere I go in the Baha'i world uh, I find that there's problems when individuals come to me and say oh there's something wrong with my local assembly. They're so immature, they can't do this, they can't do that, and so on. And I think, well, you know, the House of Justice didn't say they were perfect. We're giving birth to something. A baby is not perfect, you know, but we give birth to it and we nurture it. Then I go and meet with local assemblies, and they say, oh, the believers, they're ridiculous. 
We already told them that four years ago in a letter. Why are they still doing it? Or you know, so things like this. And they have the same attitude. And this is what's wrong with the world. There is a dysfunction between two components of society, individuals and, um, and institutions. In fact, even in America right now, you know they're arguing over gun control, do you know this? Yes. They're arguing like mad. And I'm thinking, couldn't we have solved this a long time ago, like 250 years ago? The, the reason is, is that when they first formed the government in the United States, uh, it took them 11 years. You know, they got their freedom from England and then for 11 years, until you know, from 1776 to uh, 1787, they had no government. They, they called that the disunited states of America, that 11 year period. And during that time, they debated what should the government have. And basically all they did was analyze every government in Europe and in the past and all the things that went wrong. And they said, we're gonna correct every mistake of the past. So they said, first of all, uh, we gotta make sure that religion has nothing to do with it because religion has, caused tyranny, you know, because they got too much control and they dominated the individual. So religion has to be separate from government. Two, we got to make sure that everybody has the right uh, to speak freely, so we'll have freedom of speech. Secondly, we can't suppress the, uh, the newspapers and the press, and we must have that. You understand? Everything that we're trying to do was just control government to the extent that it couldn't uh, overtake the individual. That's all they were thinking about. And then they said, but hold on, what happens if the government gets too powerful? It could control the people with its weapons. So therefore, citizens must have the right to overthrow the government with weapons, so they must have the right to bear arms. And I always thought the right to bear arms was that you could have short sleeves, but actually it was <laughs> the right to bear arms. And so they said that this, because all they were really concerned about 250 years ago was the relationship between the individual's rights and the government's rights because they were so afraid of it. Well, the House of Justice is saying, this has been going on now since the beginning of time, this argument. And still today, we're besieged by it. And now a completely new model is coming about where there is love and unity, mutual affection between them. And so then they go on to say that communities, and they refer to communities, um, uh, and they, they talk about how the community also develops. So I'm gonna ask you something. Where are these unassuming settings that the House of Justice is saying is emerging? Where are these, because they're mentioning these unassuming settings, um, uh, and they say that these unassuming settings are where the relationships that bind the communities together are changing. I want to read this. They say, the light of the revelation is destined to illumine every sphere of endeavor. In each, the relationships that sustain society are to be recast. In each, the world seeks examples of how human beings should be to one another. This is what the House of Justice is saying. In the world, something is changing in unassuming settings where they're recasting the whole way in which human beings relate to one another, how human beings should be to one another. I'm going to do you a quiz, okay? I'm going to read you from encyclopedia today, the most recent encyclopedia. I'm going to mention you um, a few places in the world, and I want you to guess what they are. It says here, blank with a population of 180,000 was founded in the 11th century. Blank is well known for being the leading rice producing province of its country. Who can guess what that is? I'll read it again. Blank with 180,000 people was founded in the 11th century Blank is well known for being the leading rice producing province of its country. Who would like to guess? Oh, someone gets, stand up. It's Bantavang, Cambodia. Pretty unassuming, isn't it? The leading rice, that's the best they can come up with. The leading rice producing province of its country. Okay, let me try something else. This one says, blank. 210,000 people. Agriculture is the primary activity of blank. The town supplies agricultural products like cauliflower, potato, mustard seed, and other vegetables to neighboring states. The economy is mainly based on agriculture, but it also produces footwear and garments in households. <laughs> Iowa, read it again. 210,000 people. Agriculture is the prime uh, 
uh, activity of, of it, produces cauliflower, potato, mustard, and other vegetables, and also has, produces footwear and garments, mainly in households. Anyone want to guess? It's pretty unassuming, isn't it? Bihar, Sharaf, India. Okay. You getting the idea? Let me read you another place. It says blank is struggling to find political stability, battling economic woes, and stubborn re rebel insurgencies. Who wants to guess? Australia? Blank is struggling to find political stability, battling economic woes and stubborn insurgencies. And this is, this is from a, an article just in the last two days. Who can guess? The Republic of Congo. How about this? Blank is one of the most culturally diverse countries on the face of the earth. According to recent data, blank has 841 different languages of a population of about 6.2 million. It is also one of the most rural countries in the world, as only 18% of its peoples live in urban centers. Blank is one of the world's least explored, culturally and geographically, and many undiscovered species of plants and animals are thought to exist in the interior of blank. Papua New Guinea. Are you getting the idea? How about, okay, let me read you another one, just one more. See if you can guess this one, this should be pretty easy. Blank is 25 miles long and 12 miles wide, with a population of 20,000. <laughs> can anyone guess? It's obviously 10, all right. 25 miles long and 12 miles wide? 20,000 people, my university had more than 20,000 people. Okay, isn't that amazing? In such unassuming settings. Now you're saying, why is it that I'm mentioning these? It's because the Universal House of Justice in the ninth paragraph of this message, they explained that this is possible, this new step that we're taking to build Mashwakalaskars is possible in these places because they're doing something they are advancing the process of entry by troops it, to such an extent that it's possible. The way in which they describe it, they seem to imply that a Mashwakalaskar is something that is like a flower that comes at the stage of development of any community. And these ones have reached it first. Now, if you had asked me a year ago to say, well, there's gonna be seven new houses of worship, where are they gonna be? Do you think that I would have picked those seven? How many of you would have picked those seven? You know, what's not on that list? London, Paris, New York, you know, Moscow, uh, Chicago. You know, what's not on that list? And these places, I mean, they're not even the biggest, uh, many of them are not even in their country. If you said there was gonna be one in India, you probably wouldn't have even said Bihar Sharaf. If you said Cambodia, you wouldn't have said this. Now, the House of Justice has basically helped us along in this regard. We should have been ready for this Rezvan message. I want to read you three messages from the House that, that kind of crept up on us. December 28, 1999, do you remember this? What were you doing the last day before the end of the year 1999? How many of you are getting ready for a big party? It was a song, you're gonna party like it's 1999? And on December 28, just three days before 2000, the House of Justice wrote a letter and it was called Further Application of the Laws of the Katabiak Das. And basically, they said that there's some new laws in the Katabi Octus because gradually the Octus is unfolding. And one of the new laws that is now going to be enforced for the first time is the law of saying the uh, Lawapa 95 times. The Hukukala, they had already announced some time before that. Then they went on to say that there's two kinds of spiritual devotion. They said there's individual spiritual development and community spiritual development. And they were talking about individual community development here in 1999. And they said, but there's also community development. They said, the spiritual growth generated by individual development is reinforced by loving association among the friends in every locality, by worship as a community, and by service to the faith to one's fellow human beings. So they're saying that there's individual spiritual development and community. 
because these are two things. The individual spiritual development we've talked about, prayer and reading uh, the greatest name. They said the communal aspects, the prayer and service of a godly life relate to the law of the Mashvakalaskar, which appears in the Kataviyaktas. Now, they say something interesting here. They say, although the time has not come for the building of local Mashvakalaskars, the holding of regular meetings for worship open to all and the involvement of Baha'i communities in project of humanitarian service are expressions of this element of Baha'i life and a further step in the implementation of the law of God. So in 1999, they're telling us that the law of the Mashvakalaskar one of the most vital institutions of Baha'u'llah that, that's destined to exist in every city of the planet. That law can be fulfilled in 1999 through devotional gatherings and service. Because we finally realize the Mashra Glaskar is not the building. The building is just the physical expression of the attitude of communal worship and combined with service. That when you combine service with communal worship, that becomes the law of the Master Kalaskar. So we really already have temples anywhere in the world where we are holding devotional gatherings and serving the faith. It's the germ of the temple. The temple is just the physical expression. That's why Adabaha could put a rock down and say the temple is already built because the temple is something there. So that was exciting in, in 1999. Who remembers that message in 1999? was exciting. We should have really been excited. But then we got even more excited two years later in 2001. Because the House of Justice in 2001, just two years later, said that a feature of the fifth epoch, and basically, you know, the, uh, the Guardian said that the uh, age of the faith as it develops these hundred years falls into epochs, and we happen to be in the fifth epoch, which we understand will finish in 1921. So we have you know, about seven or eight years to go. So we know during the fifth epoch certain things will happen. And then the House of Justice says one feature of the fifth epoch will be the raising up of more houses of worship. They say national houses of worship as circumstances permit. They said that in 2001. So we all said, oh, okay, they're going to have to announce them in, in one of these plans. The next plan, no houses of worship. Then the next plan, we said, well, in the next five-year plan there has to be. We didn't get it. Then I was waiting and I said to every Baha'i I knew, I said, when the five-year plan that we're in now, the one that was just announced two years ago, I said, there's going to be temples. You know why I thought that? Because it takes a long time to build temples. The Indian temple took more than 10 years. And I said, if we don't start now, the House of Justice will have been wrong to say that new temples would be raised in the fifth epoch. I knew they couldn't be wrong. I know we can't build temples that fast. So I knew. And then the five-year plan came out two years ago, not a temple. And so I was very mad. And people said, how come there's no temple? I said, well, the house has got to be right. And then they waited till this resvan. And they announced seven new temples. And I realized why they did it in the very first sentence. Because they said 100 years ago at Rezvan, Adabaha launched the American temple. And now, a hundred years ago to the Rezvan, they, they announced these temples. And suddenly, we have, we're going to have more temples in the world. We're going to more than double the temples in the world, which means that something is happening in the Baha'i world. Because the House of Justice said that, they, let me explain that they say this. This is what they say before they say the, the local temples. They say the correlation, well, let me, let me go first. They say the Mashra Galaskar, described by Avda Baha as one of the most vital institutions of the world, weds two essential, inseparable aspects of Baha'i life. The Mashra Galaskar weds two inseparable aspects. What are the two inseparable aspects of Baha'i life? Worship and service. This is the new kind of religion. You just don't worship. You have to act. In other words, service and you can't just go and pray. You have to pray and serve, and the Master Kalaskar does both. He said, the union of these two is reflected in the coherence that exists among the community building features of the plan, particularly the burgeoning of devotional spirit that finds expressions in gatherings for prayer, and an educational process that builds capacity for service to humanity. Now listen to what they're saying here. 
the correlation of worship and service is especially pronounced in those clusters around the world where Baha'i communities have significantly grown in size and vitality and where engagement in social action is apparent. Okay, so basically they're saying in certain places in the world where they have significantly grown in size and vitality and where they're engaged in social action, he says, they go on to say that it is within these clusters that in the coming years the emergence of local mashrugal askars can be contemplated. So this is not really an announcement of seven temples. This is the announcement of a huge evolutionary step in the history of mankind. That mankind is transforming and the mashrugal askars that they're building are just the evidence of it. They're just like a flower is the evidence of the growing of a plant. And I believe we'll see many more temples. I believe we'll see. Now, Sydney, of course, we can't say that. We can't say very much because we were blessed with one of the first continental temples in the world. But I like to think about the fact that right now, as the House of Justice is preparing to build seven more temples, and one is in construction, so eight temples are now in the process, to think about the fact that it was exactly... Okay, what was 1958 from now? Who can do math on that? How many years? Fifty-four years ago. 1958. Who can tell us what happened in 1958? And if your name is Graham Hassel, you can't answer this. Okay. What happened in 1958? March 22nd of 1958. Can anyone remember? Who was here? Who was a Baha'i in 1958? Nobody. Okay. You were? Okay. It so happens that that's when they had the foundation stone ceremony of the Sydney Temple. The Sydney Temple was on March 22nd, 1958. There was a conference in Sydney, an intercontinental conference. The Garden had fall, called four conferences, and they, uh, they were in the three of the places where temples were to be built. And he gave some plaster to Mother Dunn from Maku where the Bob had been in prison for nine years. Uh, he gave this plaster um, uh, to Mother Dunn, and she placed it in the ground, and they had a ceremony, and they dedicated this temple. And I think it's befitting that tonight we recall that occasion. I'm going to play you the recording of the very opening of that ceremony. You can hear on this recording, Collis introduces her, you can hear very faintly. She says, can I hold on to you? She said, you can hear her on this recording that I'm about to play for you. She says, can I hold on to you? Uh, and then she says a prayer from memory, which is, oh God, my haven in my distress. And, and she says the whole prayer and thereby opens the temple. And as we are now going to be dedicating eight new temples, it's nice for us to think back to that occasion in Sydney. So I would like to close tonight's uh, um, uh, program by playing for you the opening of the Temple uh, Cornerstone uh, Ceremony in Sydney, March 22nd, 1958. Friends, we shall start. This the Temple Dedication Ceremony by opening with a prayer from our dear and beloved Clara Dunn, who, as you all know, was the pioneer to this continent, who has established and been responsible for establishing a world faith on one of the continents of the world. Can I hold on to you? Oh, Lord, my God, my haven and my distress, my shield and my shelter in my wall, my asylum and refuge in time of need, and in my loneliness, my companion, in my anguish, my solace, and in my solitude, 
a loving friend. The remover of the pangs of my sorrows and the pardoner of my sins. Holy unto thee do I turn, fervently imploring thee with all my heart, my mind, and my tongue to shield me from all that runs counter to thy will. In this, the cycle of thy divine unity, and to cleanse me of all defilement that will hinder me from seeking, stainless and unsullied, the shade of the tree of thy grace. Have mercy, O Lord, on the feeble. Make whole the sick and quench the burning thirst. Gladden the bosom wherein the fire of thy love doth smolder, and set it aglow with the flame of thy celestial love and spirit. Robe the tabernacles of the barn unity with the vesture of holiness, and set upon my head the crown of thy favor. Illumine my face with the radiance of the orb of thy bounty, and graciously aid me in ministering at thy holy threshold. Make my heart overflow with love for thy servants, and grant that I may become the sign of thy mercy, the token of thy grace, the promoter of concord amongst thy loved one, devoted unto thee, uttering thy commemoration and forgetful of self, but ever mindful of what is thine. O Lord, my God, stay not from me the gentle gale of thy pardon and grace, and deprive me not of the wellspring of thine aid and favor. Neath the shade of thy celestial wings, let me nestle and cast upon me the glance of thine all protecting eye. Loose my tongue to laud thy name midst thy servants, and my voice may be raised in great assemblies and from my lips may stream the flood of thy praise. For thou art in truth the gracious, the glorified, the merciful, the omnipotent. So I'll invite Tom to come back up. Um, to if, if anybody has any questions or answers, and then where Loretta is going to close with a a prayer. Thank you, Tommy. Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Barbara. I changed my mind. Uh, you, you should call me Tommy. Uh, I don't like the way the Mr. Tom Price sounded. Go back to Tommy. Um, so, does anyone have any questions? And if, at all, or any comments, or anything? Yes, right here. I'm not sure which tapes you're hearing, um, but just like talks at various schools and so on. Yeah, I stole them from everybody I can get my hands on. <laughs> uh, no, really, I just read the Baha'i writings, uh, meditate, pray, meditate, and, and think about these things a lot. Um, I, I was for, I don't know how long it was, but from 1988 until, 19, until about five, six years ago, I only spoke about music throughout the Baha'i world, and I was giving summer school sessions all over uh, Europe, North America on music and concerts and so on. And about five or six years ago, I got so tired 
of speaking about the same subject over and over again, the arts and music, the arts and music, that I told one of the summer schools that I was uh, teaching at, I said, I don't want to do music anymore. And the schools every year were completely booked out, the music schools that I was teaching at. I said, I want to talk on science and spirituality. And so I said, oh, yeah. And they had a meeting, and they wrote back. I can just imagine what they said in the meeting. You know, Tom Price wants to speak on science and spirituality. And, and, um, and they said, no. <laughs> they, said, they said, if you don't want to speak on music, we don't want you. And so I was very frustrated, but I just decided music and science are quite uh, related because music is both an art and a science. So I started doing some research, and a few other schools asked me to speak, and I started doing that. But really, um, I don't like to prepare in the same way that most people prepare talks. You think that I have uh, my talks written out, but I don't. I just have the quotations, and sometimes I have other things. So, but I do like to meditate, and I do actually meditate every morning. And I try to come up always with analogies, because I found that's what Abdu'l Baha did and to meditate on those analogies and just to think about them. For the five-year plan, uh, uh, I remember reading a, uh, I remember not reading, I remember hearing a talk. Some of the youth remember it, because I remember Peter Kahn gave this talk in Graham Hassel's living room um, uh, when Graham was young. And I remember it well, because his poodle bit me on the finger uh, at that time. No, I'm serious. You don't remember your poodle? Yeah, I, I, it's, it still hasn't healed yet, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, it was a very well-trained poodle. It bit me. Yes. And, and Peter Kahn said that he was asked to give a, uh, uh, write a study guide for the promised day has come for the American National Spiritual Assembly where they were publishing study guides. And he said, I can do that. And so he read the promised day has come and he prepared to write the study guide. And then he, he said before writing the study guide, he reread some of the book. And as he reread the book, promised day has come, he said, um, he, he learned something in the second reading that he hadn't gained in the first reading. And this was a little surprising to him because, as you know, he was very intelligent and he, you know, he was used to reading things once and, and grasping everything. So he said, let me read it again. And he read it again and he said he found other things in the third reading that he didn't get in the first and second. And he thought this was curious. So he said, how long will this process go? And he read it again. And then he read it again and he read it again. And he said every time he kept getting things, he said he read it 17 times. And he still uh, was getting things the 17th time. He finally, he went ahead and wrote the study guide. And we were thinking at the time, um, well, if he, he could, has to read it 17 times, how many would we have to read? Because his mind was absolutely brilliant. And he, would, he taught us this, all the youth in this, that this is how you have to read the Guardian's writings over and over again. And when Peter passed away, just fairly recently, the House of Justice, they only listed six qualities of Peter Kahn. You know, whenever someone passes away, they list the high qualities of Peter Kahn, and you're always interested to see what they say. One of the six, they said, was that he impressed upon the Baha'i youth the need to study the writings of the Guardian. Even the House of Justice, some 30, 40 years later, they knew that this was one of the things that Peter Kahn wanted to impress upon us, to read the writings of the Guardian. And so when I wanted to do my very first talks, I had to do them on the five-year plan, I said, I'm going to Peter Kahn this message. I call Peter Conning, I, that's a verb, which means to read it 17 or more times. And so what I did, I, I, I put it on my, uh, like an iPod. I recorded the message of the House of Justice that was the long one, the 28 December message. I recorded it. Um, it took an hour and 10 minutes, if you want to try it. It, takes, it was a long message recorded, hour and 10 minutes, put on the recording, and I walked every day for six weeks and listened to it every single day, two or three times. So uh, that many times. And I think it was probably after about two or three weeks that some really good ideas finally came to me. And so we have to break out of this notion that you can read something once and grasp it. We have to understand that things soak in very deeply through long meditation. And then I read something from Shoghi Effendi that was really interesting. He said, the more we read the writings, the more we realize how our previous notions were erroneous. Have you read that? Anyone read that? He said, the more we read and study the writings, the more we realize how our previous notions were erroneous. I thought, this is so contrary to the way in which most people in academia work. Once they have an idea and they've been teaching it and they think it's right, they will defend it to the death. If a new idea comes along, they will fight it because it will invalidate their entire life. In other words, their mentality is we must try and maintain 
a belief in the truth of something that we previously held. And here Shoghi Effendi says, this is a new attitude. Everything you know is wrong and something will become right. And then you learn the, the joy of discovering something new, the joy of finding. Baha'u'llah in one prayer, he even says that all the attributes of God are in one sense a blasphemy. You know, like the God is the all-knowing, the all-wise, the merciful. So how can that be wrong? It's a blasphemy because it's still limiting God. At some level, everything is wrong. Isn't that an interesting way? And so this is a very good attitude. This is the attitude that the tutors must have in their study circles, that they have as much to learn as we all have as much to learn. So I think that, that um, uh, there's nothing special about what I do or what anybody does. Uh, it's all in the writings. It's all in the messages of the House of Justice. I like to read them over and over and over again, not just once. You know, some of these messages we get, we read them once at a meeting and then we put them away and we think we read them. But we need to open them every day and read them all the time. Treat the writings, even the house messages, like food. You eat food every day. You don't, you know, you know if you get a book that you've already read, someone says, here's a novel, you say, no thanks, I've already read it. But food, you don't treat it that way. If you went to someone's house and they're serving fish, you don't say, well, no thanks, I ate fish once in my life, I don't need to eat it anymore. Because it's a different mentality. We have to treat the writings differently to everything else we read. So that's the only comment I could say. So uh, thank you all. That's all the questions we have time for. No, that's all the time we have questions for. No, what, what? Yeah, that's all the time we have. But I hope to be back here in 24 years next time I come, but thank you all for having me here tonight. I had a great time.